Welcome everybody to the in diaspora call with Dr. Vivek Murthy, who will be having a fireside chat with uh, uh, Dr. Sejal Hathi, the in diaspora one of our in diaspora board members. Let me just start for those of you that are not familiar with in diaspora by introducing who we are. We are a nonprofit 501c3 organization founded in 2012 by the successful investor and entrepreneur M.R. Rangaswamy from San Francisco, who is actually with us on the call today and who you'll be seeing towards the end of the call. Uh, our mission is to work with the global Indian diaspora across a variety of different professions to transform their success into meaningful impact worldwide. And we focus extensively on social impact and social change. Uh, there's a variety of different activities that we've done this year, but uh, just in brief, the three biggest items that uh, in diaspora has worked on this year include uh, COVID relief, where the Indian diaspora stepped up very generously uh, within a short span of time to donate $1.2 million via in diaspora that were channeled to two organizations. One is Feeding America in the United States and the other is Goonj in India. And this was to provide uh, food relief to those that needed it in the time of COVID. And I'm glad to say that this resulted in 8 million meals being fed, uh, which uh, uh, we are really thankful to our network for. Another accomplishment or another activity that uh, we were very engaged in was uh, the uh, stance for racial justice, the movement for racial justice. We are very involved in that and we not only released a statement but then backed it up by action where many of in diaspora's network are engaged in uh, making significant investments into African-American owned startups. And several of uh, uh, our members, many of whom are actually present on this call today, are also very involved in actively mentoring uh, uh, African-American kids uh, in uh, various HBCUs or historically black colleges and universities. And uh, lastly, we recently released an in diaspora business leaders list, which was a compilation of the top Indian diaspora in business uh, from the Fortune 500 and Forbes 2000 companies across the world. And uh, there were 60 executives on this list. We recently held a press conference on the subject where we focused very extensively on areas like uh, environmental sustainability, uh, gender equality, uh, and several others. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, th this is just a quick introduction for you to in diaspora, those of you that are not familiar. Uh, the purpose of today's call, like I said, is to uh, welcome uh, Drs. Vivek Murthy and uh, Sejal Hathi. Uh, Vivek, of course, really needs no introduction. Uh, I'll leave it to Sejal to provide uh, a formal introduction to, uh, to Dr. Murthy. But uh, Vivek was the Surgeon General, as I'm sure all of you know, in the uh, Obama administration and one of the leading experts in our country uh, on, uh, on public health. And indeed, among the Indian diaspora, really one of the leading experts around the world in the, in the area of public health. Uh, he will be having a fireside chat with uh, Dr. Sejal Hathi, our board member, and I'll introduce Sejal more formally in just a second. Before I do that, I do want to make sure that I welcome three student groups that are with us today, and we are delighted to have them, delighted that they are uh, partnering with us for this event. We have with us the National South Asian Medical Student Association, or SAMSA. We have the Stanford University chapter, which, by the way, is Sejal's alma mater of the Asian Pacific American Medical Student Association. And we have the South Asian Medical Student Association at uh, the University of Michigan Medical School. So delighted to have uh, you with us. And I'm sure that uh, throughout this call, you'll be adding some uh, perspective from the younger generation, which is uh, so valuable. Uh, now to introduce Sejal before I turn it over to her. Uh, Dr. Sejal Hathi is a resident physician at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts General Hospital and an award-winning social entrepreneur dedicated to building better health systems for vulnerable populations globally. She received her MD, MBA degrees from Stanford and her BS with honors from Yale. Like I said, she serves on the board of in diaspora, and so that makes her my boss, so I'm going to be on my best behavior tonight, uh, and an organization called The Arena. Uh, 
She also recently started a podcast called Civic Rx on how COVID-19, the pandemic, is transforming how we live, work, build communities, and define ourselves as Americans. And one of our very first conversations was with none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci. So Sejal, without further ado, let me turn it over to you. I know you have a lot to talk to Vivek about. Uh, I should mention that the conversation between Sejal and Vivek will last for about uh, 30 minutes. Uh, and then after that, we'll be opening up this conversation for question and answers with all the participants. Sejal, over to you. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. And thank you for facilitating this conversation. I want to start by making an introduction to Vivek. Uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy is a father, a husband, a doctor, and a serial entrepreneur who is best known for, from 2014 to 2017, his service as the United States 19th Surgeon General and a Vice Admiral in the Public Health Service Commission Corps, where he commanded a uniform service of 6,600 public health officers globally. Uh, as Surgeon General, Vivek spearheaded a campaign against the opioid crisis, and he issued the first ever Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, in which he called for the recognition of addiction, importantly, as a medical illness. But he is perhaps best known for his seminal work identifying, elevating, galvanizing social and political capital to address loneliness as a public health crisis. And this is a mantle that he's carried forward to today with his new book, Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World. This book is um, beautiful. It's a richly researched poignant exploration, part memoir, part science, part cultural history on what it means to live a life of dignity, a life of purpose, and a life of love. And I strongly encourage any of you who haven't yet um, picked up a copy to do so after this call. So it's about this commitment to loneliness, this challenge truly before us all that we're going to talk today. But I want to pause for a moment and um, highlight why I think Vivek, Dr. Murthy, is so beautifully equipped to discuss this topic. He is, of course, an authority, a public health authority and um, a researcher of the subject. But he also is that rare breed of leader who practices what he preaches, who has um, preserved and exudes truly a, an incredible humanity in, in everything that he does. He speaks um, with love. He um, reaches out to people with a sense of empathy. He um, does everything that he does with a sense of gratitude. And I, I first experienced this when I was a medical student who reached out to him for advice several years ago. And though he had just been appointed as Surgeon General, he nonetheless took the time to talk to me. And I will remember that always. So Vivek, thank you so much for being here today and for agreeing to talk to us about loneliness. Well, Sejo, let me just say thank you for that incredibly kind introduction. And um, I remember that conversation we had uh, when you were a medical student and um, I was equally as impressed with you uh, then as I am with all the wonderful work you've done uh, to this day. So thank you for having this conversation together. Absolutely. So Vivek, I want to get started by asking a little bit about your personal journey to this subject. One doesn't become Surgeon General and uh, focus on necessarily loneliness or a human connection and, and social connection, unless perhaps one has had experience with that personally. And so I, I want to ask, were there moments in your life, formative experiences from your childhood or your earlier years that really primed you, moved you, motivated you to, to study and invest in this topic in the way that you have? Yeah, well, thank you for that, Sejal. And um, let, let me just say that I'm also very grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation on this topic with all of you. Uh, this isn't a subject we typically talk about, social connection and loneliness, but I think it's extraordinarily important uh, for everyone, but particularly for our community. And in this conversation, Sejal and I will talk a little bit about why, uh, but particularly want to thank uh, MR and Sanjeev and Mansi and the rest of the Yasper team 
for making this conversation possible. You know, if you had asked me, uh, Sejal, a few years ago, uh, what my what topics I might be working on after my time in government, if you had told me we would be sitting here and talking about uh, loneliness and social connection, I would have been skeptical because it wasn't actually an issue that was on my on my radar as a public health concern. Uh, but a couple of things happened that changed that for me. Uh, most importantly, it was these conversations I had shortly after I began my tenure as Surgeon General, where I was going to communities and I was just having conversations with people about what was on their mind. I was asking them how I could help. I was trying to learn about what people's priorities were. And that was a listening tour that um, marked the beginning of my tenure. And on the one hand, I, I heard about things that would not surprise you. I heard about people's struggles with depression and anxiety. I heard about parents who were worried about their children's use of social media and were wondering if it was good for them or not. Uh, I heard from people who were struggling with obesity and diabetes and heart disease and weren't quite sure uh, how to get better. Uh, and I heard from people who were just worried about the state of their health and their community's health as they looked at all of these news articles that told them that we were getting less and less healthy, even though we were spending more and more money on healthcare. But what I did not expect was that behind many of these personal accounts were these deeper threads of loneliness, where people would often say to me, I feel I have to carry all of these burdens by myself, or I feel if I disappear tomorrow, nobody would even notice, or I feel invisible. And what was striking to me is I wasn't hearing this just from elderly uh, Americans who were alone in nursing homes, which is one of the stereotypes I came to realize that people have about loneliness. I was hearing this from college students on campuses with thousands of other students. I was hearing this from moms and dads, from successful entrepreneurs, even from members of Congress who would tell me behind closed doors that they also were struggling in fact with loneliness. And so I was hearing this everywhere I went and it made me realize uh, that there was something bigger going on here and reminded me of, of two things. One was my own personal experiences with loneliness as a child, where throughout much of elementary school, I remember this uh, sort of pit in, the, in my stomach every time my mother pulled up to school to drop me off. And it wasn't that I was scared of teachers or tests. I was worried about being alone. And the scariest part of the day for me as a small child was lunchtime when I would walk into the cafeteria and wonder if there would be somebody to sit next to. And at that time, I didn't realize how common that experience was for children. I thought I was the only one. And so I felt this sense of shame uh, and a, a deep sense of shame that prevented me from ever telling my parents that I was struggling with loneliness, even though I felt deeply loved by them and my sister, even though I felt quite secure at home. Uh, I never felt um, good about sharing the fact that I was dealing with what I saw as a shameful condition. But the second thing it reminded me of, Sejal, were the experiences I had in the hospital, where I had learned so much about the body, but had learned so little about the loneliness that so many of my patients experienced. And I saw it almost from day one as a third year medical student working in the hospital, that so many patients would come in by themselves. And at incredibly difficult moments when we had to give them difficult news about a new diagnosis or when we had to have a hard conversation about choosing a new treatment pathway, I would often ask them, is there somebody I can call? Somebody who may want to be a part of this conversation because I know it'll be a hard one. And so many times they would respond by saying, I wish there was someone, but there's not. And I'll just have to have a conversation alone. And so I saw that again and again and again. And even at the time of death, in those final moments, I found that there were far too many times where the only witnesses to someone's passing were myself and my colleagues in the hospital. And so I was reminded of those experiences in the hospital and as a child, as I began my tenure as Surgeon General and began to see how much loneliness there was in the population. Um, I'll lastly just say, and something I'm happy to elaborate on later, but this was more than just a bad feeling, as I came to realize. Loneliness was in fact something that had real consequences. Uh, for our health. And as I delved into the research, I came to appreciate that, that while we think about our diet, we think about exercise as important contributors to our health, it turns out that our social connections, our relationships with one another, have a profound impact on our health and affect our risk 
of heart disease, of premature death, of anxiety, dementia, depression, sleep disturbances, and a host of other chronic conditions. So that is why I, after coming out uh, of government and even during my last, um, you know, sort of a end of my tenure, I decided to make this an issue of focus because it was a public health concern uh, that had not received enough attention. Thank you, Vivek. And what I learned in reading your book was just how profound and enduring the consequences are of our relationships and our lack of relationships, perhaps even more profound than any anything we might otherwise tackle cloistered within those hospital walls. And so I, I really do hope that medical schools and the practice of medicine more generally begin to invest and focus on this issue more intently in the future. But I, I want to ask... Um, a lot of people, particularly those of us who haven't read your book, may not fully appreciate the breadth and the significance of, of loneliness, particularly as um, distinguished by other terms that have often been bandied about in, in the news more recently, like social isolation or like solitude, which carries a nourishing connotation. Can you um, describe for us what the differences between these three terms and what loneliness really means? Sure, I can do that. And, and I'm glad you asked because it, these terms often get used interchangeably, but loneliness, it turns out, is a subjective feeling. It's a feeling that the connections we need in our life are greater than the connections that we actually have. And in that gap, we experience loneliness. This is distinct from the term isolation, which is a more objective description of the number of people we have around us. But we know, many of us from our own personal experiences, that you can be surrounded by other people, but still feel profoundly alone, which is the case for many students on college campuses. But you can also just be surrounded by a few people and feel remarkably connected and not alone at all, which is what I found in many of the villages that I have visited actually uh, in rural parts of America and in India as well. Uh, it's also distinct from solitude, which is a state of aloneness in the sense that you don't have many people or any people around you, but is a state of peaceful uh, and contented, peaceful uh, loneliness and contentedness. And so what really, the, what is the hallmark of loneliness is in fact a deeper emotional pain, a pain that all of us experience at some point in our lives and often at multiple points in our life. Uh, there really is no shame in feeling lonely or experiencing it. And in fact, I would think about loneliness the way we think about hunger and thirst, uh, because it's in many ways has its biological origins and in a similar fashion. Now we feel hungry or thirsty when our body needs food or water. And similarly with loneliness, we feel lonely when our body is lacking something that it needs for survival, which is in fact human connection. And you might say, well, is that an overstatement to say that we need human connection for survival because haven't and we have more tools to be self-sufficient. Well, it turns out that our deeper need for other people goes back thousands of years uh, to our time as hunter-gatherers, when we in fact did depend on each other for survival, and there truly was safety in numbers. So when you build trusted relationships with others, you were less likely to be eaten by a predator because you could take turns watching around the fire at night. You were less likely to starve because you could pool your food supply and share. Uh, you were likely to have help with childcare and with other challenges uh, of daily living. And so as it turns out, um, life was easier, better, and safer when we were with others. And when we were separated from our tribe, we automatically experienced a drop in our chances of survival. And our body knew that. And so loneliness or separation from our tribe uh, is something we experience as a stress state. Now in the short term, stress states can actually be quite helpful they can in fact enhance your performance. So the stress you may feel be before a big exam or before a big presentation at work uh, or before a big game, if you're an athlete, those forms of stress can really fuel you in some ways to perform better. But the problem with stress is when it lasts for a long time, when it's chronic. And when it is chronic, then we experience an elevation in stress hormones uh, that over time can lead to higher levels of inflammation that in turn can increase our risk for chronic conditions uh, like heart disease. And so that is the mechanism, the likely mechanism through which loneliness as a chronic stress state contributes, uh, in fact, to the poor health outcomes that we see. 
Got it. Um, there, there are some who would say that loneliness um, is the price that we pay for the society that we live in, specifically for the freedom, for the liberty that is endemic to characteristic of Western societies in particular, the mo modern Western societies. Would you agree with that characterization? And do you think in that sense the, the type of society we live in is in a way evolutionarily incompatible. Um, and how, how would you seek to create a different type of society that maybe would redress and mitigate the loneliness, this pain that we all suffer? Yeah, it's, it's something I struggled with in the writing of this book, uh, trying to make sense of the world we live in but also trying to imagine if there's a third way with one way being the way we're living, another way being going back to traditional societies, many of which we or our families may have experienced in India uh, or in other parts of South Asia. And, and the, but there's, is there a third path? That's what I find myself thinking about. And to answer your first question though, Sejal, I do think that the way in which we live now in the modern world does come at a price. And one of those prices is loneliness, but I don't think it has to be that way. I think we have lost so much of our connection with others, not because we have actively said we don't value people, uh, but because we have just allowed people and relationships to slip further and further down our priority list. And I don't mean our stated priority list, because if I were to stop 100 people on the street and ask them, what's your top priority in life? They would say a person or a group of people, right? If you ask me right now, who are, what's my top priority in life? I'd say, well, it's my my parents and my sister and my wife and my two children. It's, it's my family and my closest friends. Those are my priorities. Then if you were to ask me, how do I actually live my life? Is that, are my priorities as stated where I tend to put the majority of my time, my attention and my energy? Then I would have to tell you in all honesty that for much of the last 15 years, that it actually hasn't been the case, that I focus a lot more on work and on you know, impact and achievement and all the other things that we're told make us successful. But that actually has created, created a gap between my stated priorities and lived priorities. And, and the truth is, I realized over time, and particularly in the writing of this book, that that gap was really bothering me. And it was keeping me from feeling the kind of fulfillment and peace and satisfaction that I wanted to feel in my life. I also learned through the science of this that it was actually interestingly holding me back. Uh, in terms of my own health, my own well-being, my own performance, and work and in the world. Because we are truly better and function better when we're more deeply connected uh, with one another. So I, I think that while loneliness is often a feature of modern society, again, I don't think it has to be. So I, I tended in the book, I, I wrote about this in the, form, in the context of bowls. So I thought of traditional society as a, as a narrow, deep bowl, one that a, had a deep web of connections and structures in communities uh, that had allowed people to feel like they were part of a group. And maybe that was your immediate family and your extended family and the people with whom you shared a similar language. Maybe in traditional times, it was people of your, uh, you know, who were within your caste system. Uh, maybe it was, you know, other measures, you know, uh, by which people were brought together uh, in small communities, but there were many structures like that. And so, that was powerful, but it was narrow in the sense that if you did not meet the basic and often stringent requirements uh, of being in that community, you were quickly cast out. So I think about the small village my father grew up in, in India, for example, uh, which was a, an experience where he, they were extremely poor, my father and his siblings and his parents, but they never felt lonely. They always felt like they had people around them. But if one of them had said, uh, you know, I actually am not going to listen to my father and do uh, what he says and become a farmer. I'm going to go off and do something else. They could be cast out very quickly. If they decided that they didn't want to get married at the appropriate time. They could also be cast out very quickly. Um, if they happened to say that they were gay, uh, for example, they would be cast out very quickly. You know, there were all of these parameters that they had to observe in living their life. And the society in which we live in today is the opposite of that. It's a wide bowl of modest step. So we have met the ability to make our choices, to choose our identity, to be who we want to be. But there are a few structures uh, that automatically bind us together that serve as a true 
social safety net and give us an automatic sense of community. We have to seek those out uh, and put much more effort to it, into it than in traditional societies. So which raises the final question of, is there a third bowl? One that is both wide in nature that allows us to choose our identity to be who we are, even if that's not what the majority of people do, but one that also has depth to it, that has layers that allow us to be a part of a community, um, whether that's through social institutions or volunteer organizations or workplaces or the educational institution that we're a part of. And we can create that kind of third bowl society, but what it requires is a very explicit and conscious uh, shift in our priorities. And if we prioritize people and relationships, not only in our own lives, but in how we structure society, then we start designing schools in ways that actually strengthen human connection. We start designing workplaces in ways that focus on building relationships uh, between people, not just uh, workplaces to judge their success by the bottom line. We also think about our own lives and where we put our time and effort and energy, and we redefine success. Because success in modern society is defined by our ability to acquire one of three things, wealth, power, or fame. And if we achieve one of those three things, then we think we're successful, right? Um, and this is true even in professions that have uh, sort of noble intent. You know, let's just take medicine, since that's the field that Sejal and I are in, right? Like in medicine, you know, many people go into the field because they want to relieve suffering. They want to be of service uh, to the world. But then think about what we do to people in, in medical training, right? We, we start pushing them toward thinking that they're a bit, their measure of success is uh, how much they can publish, uh, the, sort of the prestige of the journal that they can actually be in, uh, how widely their, their name is recognized uh, in medical circles, in their community, in their country, and around the world. Uh, we start telling them uh, that these criteria that I just mentioned, wealth, power, and fame, that these are in fact the criteria that determine whether they're successful or not. And so if we want to build that third bowl society, a society where we can be who we are, but be deeply connected to each other, we have to put people and relationships back at the center of how we design our lives and the institutions in which we live. Yeah, and I think uh, that's important. I know we have a lot of fellow parents on this phone call, and I'm, I know that this also begins in childhood and pressing upon our children that they matter, that no matter what they do in life, every single one of us has something deep and generative and powerful to offer to the world. And one of our greatest tasks and opportunities is to simply recognize and embrace our own agency, so to speak. Um, but I want to talk about some of the solutions that you share in your book and a, a beautiful and counterintuitive topic both that, that you um, discuss is, is service and you uh, explain service as an antidote to loneliness. Uh, one of the best things a lonely person can do is to do something for someone else. So, um, when you give to someone what you most desire for yourselves, be it simply a smile or love, um, you feel more whole, you feel less <coughs> lonely. Can you talk about how this works? Okay. Can you talk about how service serves as an antidote to loneliness? Sure. Well, Sejal, this was actually not a concept that had occurred to me when I started writing the book. It was something that came through the stories of so many of the people I encountered and just by examining their lives. And what we became increasingly clear is that service is a powerful antidote to loneliness, perhaps one of the most powerful that we have. And the reasons are actually quite interesting, and they have to do with what we talked about a little earlier, about the biological impact of loneliness. See, so what happens is, if you imagine like thousands of years ago when we were in fact in those hunter-gatherer groups, when we were separated, our body entered into this state of threat, right? We automatically knew that our chances of survival had dropped. So what that did to us, in addition to putting us in a stress state, is it turned our attention inward, so we were more focused on ourselves, it also made us more hypervigilant and in fact more suspicious of what was happening around us. Because if there was even a 1% chance that the crack that we heard behind us was a predator stepping on a twig, we wanted to interpret it that way because our life could depend on it. 
But I wanna, want you to imagine for a moment the modern world where we're experiencing loneliness, where our attention turns inward because we feel like we're under threat, where we're actually hypervigilant and more suspicious of people around us. That's not exactly a recipe for building stronger connection, right? And you can imagine how those tendencies, which are baked into our nervous system over thousands of years, how those can both perpetuate our loneliness, but also contribute to an erosion of self-esteem as we feel more, the more and more lonely we are, that it's our fault or because we are broken in some way. And so in that way, loneliness becomes a downward spiral. Now, why does service uh, fit in so beautifully here? Because service actually shortcuts those mechanisms that deepen our loneliness. It shifts our attention from ourself to another person in the context of a positive interaction. But it also very importantly reaffirms for us that we have value to bring to the world. And I say this because it is very easy in our lives, regardless of how successful you are by traditional definitions, it is very easy uh, to feel that you aren't worthy, that you don't have value, um, that you're an imposter uh, in, in some way. And part of the reason it's so easy to feel that is because we are dealing uh, with many, many, many years of messaging from media, from social media, from pe well-intentioned people around us who keep telling us, again, that our success is based on extrinsic factors, our ability to acquire these external things like wealth, power, and reputation. And so if we have even a moment of doubt that we've done that, or if we are caught up in this vortex of self-comparison, which is highly accelerated, in fact, by social media, then even if we've done an extraordinary amount, our lives may seem inferior by comparison to the people whose posts we're reading on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. And so for all those reasons, we have to be aware of the fact that there is no amount of achievement um, that can substitute for a true intrinsic sense of self-worth. And many of us probably know people who are extraordinarily successful by traditional terms, but are profoundly unhappy in their lives and who feel very alone. And so service, it turns out, is powerful. But here's the last thing I'll mention about service, which I found to be um, extraordinary, is that the kind of service one has to do to build connection with others is not extraordinary in, 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 in size or scope. You know, it, this is, we're not talking about quitting your job and moving halfway across the world to serve uh, those uh, who, are, who are struggling. We're not talking about going uh, to work for a week, uh, you know, not Habitat for Humanity so you can build homes. Those are both fine things to do. But service in small doses can have this powerful impact on us. So for example, think about service, for example, as anything you may do to help lift up another human being during a time of need. Uh, the smile you may give a stranger is a form of service. And if you've ever been someone who was smiled at by a stranger who received an unexpected, uh, just word of kindness from, uh, kindness from a, a waiter at a restaurant or a barista at a coffee shop, you know what I'm talking about, of how those small gestures can make a big impact on how you feel. Reaching out to a coworker, for example, just to check and see how they're doing during this extraordinarily difficult time of COVID-19, that might just be a five minute conversation. But what you say to people when you check on them with genuine concern. What you say to people when you show up in their lives with the willingness to give them your full attention and not be distracted by other things around you while you're having conversation, you are saying to them, I see you, you matter, you have value. And you can do that without uttering many words at all, simply by being fully present. And so if we broaden how we think about service, we will realize that even in this time of COVID-19, when we can go and volunteer at a local community organization, or where it may be hard to go and volunteer uh, at the temple or the mosque or your church, there are still many ways that we can serve. And there are people all around us uh, who are struggling from time to time. We're having a difficult experience, uh, figuring out how to homeschool their children while also teleworking, figuring out how to manage uh, their own education at a time when schools are shutting down because of this virus. And simply a kind word, checking on them, 
having food delivered to them, offering to virtually babysit for 10 minutes uh, for friends who may be young, you know, parents of young children. Those are powerful, powerful acts of service that help them, but also help strengthen your connection with them as well. That's a beautiful, um, beautiful concept, Vivek. Thank you. I want to ask my last question to you. So for, for this one, with this as well, if you have any final thoughts to share before we open the discussion, please do. But you have discussed COVID-19. And of course, we are living in a deeply unsettling moment in our country's history. And not merely for COVID-19, but also for the protest, um, rightfully protests, rightfully belatedly waged um, against the killing of Black bodies and against the racial injustice that has long marked our country's original sin. Um, Our country is convulsed by these protests and by anger at the mistreatment of other people, um, black and brown bodies. And as Indian Americans, uh, we have been both victims of and accomplices uh, to this prejudice. And at the same time, um, we have benefited from many of the civil rights gains of the last century. So reflecting on this and reflecting on especially this moment, what is our obligation as an Indian diaspora community to stand in solidarity with those who are fighting for racial justice? And more pointedly, how might doing so assuage our own loneliness, reaffirm our own sense of worth? Yeah, it's, a, it's the right question for this time, Sejal. And it turns out it's always been the right question, um, but it feels more timely now than ever before, given what we're experiencing with racial injustice. You know, I, I think there are, there are few communities that I think are better um, poised to address issues like racial injustice than communities of immigrants who have often experienced injustice and inequality in the countries from which they came. And I think about my own parents. You know, my parents came uh, from India when we were, we were very young. You know, we made pit stops in England and in Canada and then landed here in the United States when I was three and my sister was four. And I think so often about the journey that they made from the extraordinary, extraordinarily poor village in which my father grew up and the modest home in which my mother grew up in Bangalore, uh, all the way half a world away to a country where they knew no one, had no funds or resources or connections, uh, and had to build an entire life in a new world on their own. This is a familiar story, right, that so many of our parents and us may have gone through. And I I actually was thinking about that a great deal on the day I was sworn in uh, to be Surgeon General, because I realized that no matter what I did in my own life, no matter how much I moved from the place where I started to the place where I ended up, no matter how big that jump was, it would never equal the leap that they made in their own lives. And that was humbling and it, was, it remains true today. But the reason why they came here is important. The reason so many of us and our families came to this country is because we believe that in the United States, lay the opportunity for a better life, a life where we would have opportunities, where we would be judged not by the color of our skin or by our caste or by the fact that we had a funny sounding name, but we'd be judged by our willingness to work hard, to be honest, to be a a contributing member of a community. Now, have we always lived up to those ideals as America? No, but we've seen glimpses of it in our better moments, that is in fact what guides us. And as members of this community now, as people whose families have known a very different, in some cases a very unequal way of life, I do think that one of the greatest gifts that we can give this country, one of the greatest services we can render to America is to pick up that mantle of equity, of justice, of kindness, and to make sure that it is reflected 
both in how we lead our lives, but also in the causes that we choose to raise our voice about, that we choose to advocate for. Because it is no longer enough for us just to lead a good life. We have to also be able to act on the injustices we see in the world around us. That's the only way things get better. And that's not always a comfortable thing for people like many of us who may have been raised to believe that we shouldn't get involved in things like politics, we shouldn't get involved in controversy, that we should stay uh, in a different path, particularly if you're in a field uh, like healthcare, where people worry about alienating patients, you know, if they get engaged in politics. But sometimes speaking the truth can be looked at as political. But that doesn't make it any less important to stand up for, to fight for, to speak up for. And if we ask, what is the deeper truth that we're fighting for? That deeper truth is the fact that all of us have a deeper connection to each other and an intrinsic source of value. Our value is not our ability to achieve wealth, power, and fame. Our value is much more intrinsic. It is ultimately based on our ability to give and to receive love. And, and love in all its forms, kindness, generosity, warmth. That is what makes people's lives better. It's what makes the world better. It's one of the most important qualities in a good leader and in a good parent or brother or sister or son or daughter. We know that in our hearts. I'm telling you something that you have known from your earliest days. But we've allowed ourselves so often to forget that to allow it to recede in the background and to live a life that is guided by another set of values. And the only way life gets better for all of us is if we choose to stand up for those values again, to speak up for them, to build our life around those values, to encourage those values in our children, and to use that as the yardstick by which we measure success. That's how life gets better. And we see an opportunity here in this moment when the country is struggling once again, with the specter of racial injustice, to stand up for those who may have not been able to stand up for themselves in the past, to stand up for a set of values that actually we all have a stake in, right? If today, it might be black communities that are being discriminated against. Tomorrow, it will be brown communities that are discriminated against. The next day, it may be South Asian communities uh, who are discriminated against. It will be different communities. And so we can't just stand up for these values when it's convenient. We've got to do so at all times. And so I think this moment has particular relevance to us. And, you know, people, I sometimes think about this moment as, uh, which I never imagined we'd be in, to be honest with you, a moment where we were struggling with the pandemic, um, with frankly, a, a response that has not been as good as it could have been, but one that has left us in an extraordinary state of uncertainty, um, struggling at the same time with an exacerbation of racial injustice in our country, which has just been so wrenching uh, to see and experience. Um, who knew that we would be in this moment at this time, but here we are, and we can go down one of two paths. We can either allow uh, the fires that are burning around us to consume us and to darken our view of each other and the world, or we can go in a new path, a path of rebuilding, a path of renewal, a path of revival. And that's a path that is only built by us recentering ourselves on our connection with each other, on recognizing that at the end of the day, it is our relationships that are the foundation on which we build everything else, including good schools, successful workplaces, strong government, and a healthy community. If you don't think that this applies to politics and policy, I would just tell you that policies have an extraordinary impact on people's ability to connect with one another. What happens when we cut up neighborhoods, for example, with highways? What happens when we uh, design cities in ways that uh, prevent people from actually encountering each other because they can't walk anymore, they have to drive everywhere? Uh, what happens when we build workplaces that are virtual and we don't pay any attention to the fact that people have a need to see each other and interact with each other and build a relationship with each other. Policies impact 
our ability to connect with each other. And this is our moment to step back and to ask ourselves that most fundamental of questions. What really matters? And I'll tell you that at the end of a long journey of listening to thousands of stories when I was Surgeon General, of thinking deeply about this as we wrote the book on, on, you know, on loneliness and social connection, what I've been left with, the answer to that question of what really matters is each other. That we are the ones that matter to one another. And, and that's why when I think back on the patients that I cared for at the end of their life, when I think about the conversations that I was blessed to have with so many of them in those final hours, when I was just sitting by their bedside and holding their hand because there was nothing left to offer, I think about what they said. And what they talked about in those final moments was not how many followers they had on Instagram. It wasn't the latest promotion that they had received. It wasn't how much money was in their bank account. What they talked about were their relationships, the people they had loved, the relationships they wished they had spent more time with, the ones that had broken their hearts. Because in those final moments, when everything else drops away, it's our relationships that rise to the top. And so that's, to me, the most important piece of this entire experience we're going through with COVID, with racial injustice. It's, it's pushing us to realize what really matters in our life. And if we can recognize that our relationships matter and start standing up for each other and speaking up for each other, then we can not only inspire our children with the kind of values we all want them to live by, but we can build the kind of society that's fulfilling, that's nurturing, that our children truly deserve. Thank you, Vivek. So, many, so much more that we could talk about, um, but I would like to yield the floor to our audience and to the team that will facilitate the Q&A part of this discussion. Before I do, just a quick response to your final um, commentary, and that is that one of the unanticipated gifts of the COVID-19 pandemic that I've um, appreciated is a steady awakening um, among my peers in medicine, but also um, more particularly in among the elders of the Indian American community who, whereas they might once have subscribed to and embraced the tenets of, you know, Jobism, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes's philosophy that we cannot possibly be privy to the grand strategy of our, of our actions and our choices. So we must be content with simply showing up and doing a good job and clocking in and um, doing what we are expected to do. They are now asking themselves, what is, um, my, my, how can I do better for the people around me? Um, what is my responsibility to show up, to speak up, to speak out against the injustices that are so rampant in our society? And that's what I love about your book, that it really forces us to reckon with those deep questions about what do we owe each other? What is our obligation to one another? What is um, our responsibilities as members of this shared humanity and this social contract that we all signed as, as participants in this grand experiment that is the American democracy? And um, I hope that the book inspires, galvanizes others like it did me to reevaluate our values and our priorities and, and give back in the way that you have and so many in whose stories are featured in your book have as well. So with that, I, I want to pass the baton, so to speak, to the Indie Aspera team, and they will facilitate the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy and Sajal. What a powerful conversation. So we want to open it up to some questions from the audience. If you could type your questions into the chat box, we will call on you accordingly. And then please unmute yourself when I call on you. Um, our first question, I believe we have from Bharat Desai, if you would like to go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Vivek. Thank you so much for that very deep and thoughtful um, uh, sharing of your views. 
Um, so much. Could you share your thoughts on meditation and yoga as possible antidotes to loneliness and uh, isolation? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for that, that very thoughtful question. Um, I think it's almost something we actually didn't uh, talk about, which I think is very relevant, uh, is actually the power of solitude and the importance of solitude for human connection. And I mentioned this uh, because this is not entirely intuitive, right? You might think, well, why is it important to be alone if our goal is to build connection with, that, with others? And that's because it turns out that when we, are, when we approach others from a place of being grounded and centered, when we are clear about the value that we have, our intrinsic value that we bring to the world, then we're actually more able to have positive interactions with others because we can focus more on them, on being fully present instead of constantly worrying about what impression we're making and about whether we are being the person they want us to be uh, in that conversation. And meditation and yoga are actually powerful ways of us recentering ourselves and grounding ourselves. Uh, when I was a Surgeon General, one of the things that we did is we actually offered everyone in the office uh, you know, a, a free training in meditation. And then we, whenever people wanted to take time during the day to meditate, uh, we, would, uh, we made that not only acceptable, but actually it's something we encouraged. Uh, and we also would have sessions where sometimes people would want to just do group meditations together in the office. So they, the office members would organize that uh, you know, frequently on their own. But I will tell you that when we instituted um, we didn't institute anything, actually. When we offered people the uh, opportunity to get trained and when they started meditating more, it made a real difference in how we connected with and worked with each other. So I do think that meditation uh, and, and, and yoga have powerful roles uh, you know, in this. And everyone may find their own pathway uh, toward using solitude uh, to strengthen that sense of self and, and to deepen their centeredness. Uh, for some people, it may be spending time in nature that actually helps them reconnect for others. Uh, it may be music, actually, that helps them really uh, bring a sense of inspiration and centeredness to their day. We may do different things. We could be gratitude, actually, and gratitude practices that help do that for us. But whatever we do, we all need moments of solitude in our life, even if it's just a few minutes a day. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Kanwalinder Singh, I believe, has a question for you, Vivek. Hi, Vivek. Uh Great, uh, great talk, and, and I was really struck by your comment when you said that I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, I think it's, it's in many ways uh, a very powerful statement. But having said that, I have a question. What are your thoughts on us men, maybe specifically Indian men, uh, not prioritizing connections and friendships, especially with other men? Um, and and women and Indian women in particular, perhaps uh, prioritizing connections to their, you know, sisters and mothers and daughters and, and granddaughters. Are your some thoughts on that uh, sort of difference right in front of us? Well, uh, th thank you for that question, and, and it's a really great point. I, you know, it's interesting. I. I in men and women both struggle with loneliness and it's not entirely clear if one uh if men experience more loneliness than women the data is a little bit mixed but they both experience high levels of loneliness what's interesting though is it manifests in different ways in their life so with men what's really interesting is that as they get older and there are three big triggers for loneliness in men so one is retirement the other is illness and the third is a loss of their spouse uh, or a close family member. And those things are very common triggers for loneliness in men. And when loneliness manifests in men, it often shows up as anger and irritability. Uh, and if, if you're a man out there, or if you have a man in your life that you love and you're like, gosh, why are they always so angry and irritable? I would encourage you to put loneliness on the differential of what might be uh, potentially leading to, to that irritability and disconnection. It's a very, very common manifestation of loneliness in men. But I think the deeper question, uh, issue you know, at the heart of your question is why is this the case? Like why, are, why do men in fact have such a hard time building connection? And I think some of it is this stereotype of 
masculinity that we have in recent years, I think, come to embrace. Uh, it's not even in recent years. It's been this way for a while. But it's a, it's a version of masculinity that tells us being a real man means you have to be self-sufficient. It means that you shouldn't need other people, that you shouldn't express emotion, and that your primary job as a man is to achieve and to provide for your family, right? So then people drown, they push themselves fully into that. And relationships either become completely secondary or tertiary on the priority list, or they become almost evidence of weakness in a way. You know, like I, I don't want, and, you know, put aside the fact that vulnerability is clearly seen in so many uh, traditionally masculine cultures as a source of weakness. And this doesn't just affect men, it actually affects women too. Because think about how we construct the workplace now. Uh, think about like the environment that Sejal and I trained in, like in medicine. The workplace and medicine in general are very masculine environments, right? So what we do is we, uh, we make room for women in some ways, right? But then we force them to behave according to this masculine model where we say, okay, you can come to the workplace, but, but don't, don't show any emotion because that means that you're not weak. That means that you're weak, right? Or you're not up to the job or something. Whereas the reality is that, you know, in the face of it, when you start to and think about it, it, it's somewhat ridiculous, right? It's like as human beings, men and women experience emotions, right? We're going to all express those in different ways. And if you ask people to just check that at the door and not bring it to work, um, you're actually stifling like a part of who they really are. And that doesn't serve them. It doesn't serve the workplace. So if we really want to shift this, if we want... Uh, as men and women, to be able to create a culture that is more conducive to natural, normal human connection, we have to change how we define strength, right? So strength is not the absence of emotion. Strength is the confidence to embrace emotion. It's the willingness to see emotion as part of the full spectrum of the human experience. And so I think that's part of what we have to do. I'll share one last thing with you. It's some practical thing I did, actually, uh, when I realized coming out of um, my time as Surgeon General that I was actually profoundly lonely and disconnected and that I didn't have a community. Um, you know, I'll tell you that um, as, as grateful and like truly, truly grateful as I am uh, to have given, been given the privilege of serving as a Surgeon General, um, it wasn't always an easy experience, you know? And it was one where I made a, a, one critical error in judgment, which is I convinced myself because I had very little time, like in office, that I needed to do everything I could to advance the work and that it was okay if I didn't pay attention to my relationships for a while, if I just focused on work. And what happened over time is that I lost so many of the connections that I had, right? I stayed in touch with my, of course, my parents and my sister and my wife and our kids. I was, you know, they were still part of my life. But even there, I was so often distracted when I was with them. I was catching up on emails, doing messages, this and that and the other. And I came, when I finally left government, what I realized is that I was profoundly alone. Right? It wasn't that I didn't ha have people who wished me well, but I just didn't feel connected in any way. And I felt, frankly, a bit embarrassed because I thought, you know, for me to now just pick up the phone and call these friends who are probably thinking, where have you been? for the last mm -hmm. two years. I just went through a crisis and you weren't there for me or you didn't share with us like what, how you were actually doing and we all cared about you as a human being. We didn't care about you know, whatever title you had or whatever job you had, that didn't matter to us. We cared about you as a human being, you know, where were you? And I felt embarrassed to reach out because I felt ashamed you know, of that. But that just deepened and perpetuated this lack of community. A friend of mine one day told me, she said, Vivek, your problem is not that you don't have friendships. The problem is that you're not experiencing friendships. And in that, she captured so much of what many of us experience is that we have actually relationships that may have gone dormant because we've lost touch for several years and we feel profoundly alone. But we underestimate how those can be activated if we just have the courage and the willingness to reach out. If we see that kind of vulnerability as a source of strength and not as weakness. And so in 2018, when I was at a fellowship retreat, uh, I encountered two friends who Sejal knows, uh, my friends, Sunny and Dave, who are part of a fellowship that Sejal and I are part of as well. And we were walking around this lake 
uh, that was on the property and just saying how amazing it was to be with each other and we have so rarely got to see each other. And in the back of our heads, we all knew at the end of that walk, it was probably gonna be another two or three years until we saw each other again. But finally, you know, at the end, we just stopped and we said, look, we're all actually struggling with a lack of community. We all are feeling lonely and isolated in our lives. What if we make a pact with each other? What if we build what I described in the book as a moai, which is a Japanese concept? The idea is that we make a commitment to each other to be there for each other. And the commitment we made was very simple. It was that once a month, we would do a video conference call with each other, a two hour call where we would be fully present. There was no, you talk, you're talking on the phone, but you're also on Instagram and you're also checking the news and looking at the news in the background. There's none of that. You're fully focused on one another. And we also committed that when issues came up in our life in between those calls, that we would reach out, we would text each other, even if it was just one line that we would reach out and not let that moment go. And finally, we made a commitment to talk about what matters, to be real with each other, and in particular, to talk about the issues that we all are worried about, but they don't come up in our conversations. And that's our health, our relationships, and our finances, right? And so for the last two years, I can now tell you that that Moai, that brotherhood with Sunny and Dave, has had a profound impact on my life. It has impacted big decisions I made around work. It has improved my relationship with my wife, Alice, and made me, I think, a better husband who's more sensitive um, to her needs and also to my responsibilities uh, as a husband and as a father. Um, and it's made me realize every time I get on the phone with them, which I just did, in fact, yesterday, it's made me realize that the true joy in life comes from that time we have with one another, right? And so I want to redefine success in my life. You know, that success is not, the greatest successes in my life are no longer the jobs I've served in or the scores on any exams or the schools that may be listed on my resume. It's did I build and enjoy beautiful relationships in my life? Did I care for the people that I wanted to care for? Did I love with my full heart, openly, honestly? That's how I want to define success going forward. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call on um, Shama Barot, if you would like to ask your question. Hi, Dr. Murthy. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us your amazing research and, and experience. I wanted to know that now that you've written this amazing book, which I look very much forward to reading, how do you hope to share your wisdom to the greater audience? And how can we in this India Spora platform, or us specifically with our wellness community, help you in that by assisting the, the platforms that we have? Well, thank you, Shama, for those kind words and for, for that, that question. Um, you know, I, I'll say there's, there's just one thing I might modify in what you said, which is that, you know, I feel like I have a lot of wisdom to still gain. And so I, the work that I see myself doing now is, uh, is less about my sharing my wisdom and more about um, trying to convene conversations, just like what we're having now, and spark discussions. Because I, I do believe... Um, what I said earlier is, which is that the deepest wisdom that we need is the wisdom that we've had from our earliest days um, about the importance of kindness, about how central love is, about the key nature of relationships and whether or not we rise and fall or feel happy or not. And the real question is, how do we get back to those lessons? Because the journey to living a connected life is not about transforming to something we're not, it's about returning to something that we were designed to be over thousands of years. And so the question is, how do you have those conversations? And one way that I'm actually starting to see those conversations happen is actually through book clubs. I've actually started to see more and more people who are, who are taking this book and are actually using it as a point of discussion. And actually what's interesting about book clubs is they can create an opportunity and in some cases an excuse to actually talk about things which might be harder uh, to just bring up on your own. Um, so, that's one thing, and we're actually developing a whole set of, um, of, of questions that we're offering people, discussion questions and points to just gently nudge conversation to give people starting points if they want to use this as, uh, as part of their book clubs. 
So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, and Jessica, who's on the, the, the call today as well, is my, is my chief of staff, like has been helping me with this. The other thing that we're actually doing is we're, we've been going to more and more workplaces, which many have reached out actually, because some of these are small companies, some of them are, are large global companies. But what they've recognized in this time of COVID-19 is that everyone is struggling in some way, uh, that their lives have been turned upside down in some way, and that failing to actually understand and support their mental health and well-being is actually both not entirely humane in this time of crisis, but it's also a poor strategic decision uh, for the business. Because even when things start to open up in businesses and people come back, it matters what state they're in when they come back. And if people are at the end of nine, 12 months of extraordinary stress and upheaval, um, they can't necessarily bring the best in themselves to the workplace. And so what we're finding is that many companies are also interested in thinking about how to have discussions uh, around the book, thinking of it as a strategic uh, priority for them and a way to enhance the well-being uh, of their community. Uh, similarly with universities. And so whichever this setting is, whether it's facilitating um, these discussions in universities, workplaces, or in community book groups, or in faith organizations, which we're finding is another place where there has been uh, a revival of interest as faith organizations, I think, which have always centered around values, uh, recognize that those values are even more important now for the world than ever before. These are all places where we think um, discussions and opening up these conversations can be incredibly helpful. So um, we'd certainly be, uh, you know, would love to work with anyone within Diaspora in particular on how to how to see these kind of conversations, whether it's in the organizations that many of you are part of or that you run, uh, or in the communities that you're part of through book clubs or other mechanisms. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, and we have a question from Sunita Srohabshi. If she, you would like to ask her question, Sunita, please. Yes, hi, Dr. Modi. Um, currently, 40% uh, of COVID deaths are in nursing homes and uh, residents are not allowed to see their families. Um, I wonder if uh, loneliness can be considered an underlying factor that contributes to a greater vulnerability to dying from COVID. Well, that's a great question, Sunita, and it's uh, good to hear your voice uh, after a long time as well. Uh, yeah. You know, the, I, I do think it's a profound problem. I mean, there's just got the stories, heartbreaking stories uh, from nursing homes, from both nursing home residents as well as their family members um, who cannot see them. It's just, I mean, they're incredibly painful. And what I can tell you is even just my own experience, you know, caring for patients who were alone toward the end of their life is that it's extremely uh, painful for them. You know, often it's the connections around us that make the difference between uh, a good death um, and a death that's less than ideal. And, you know, the question of does it contribute to or hasten uh, death uh, in some way toward the end, that's hard to know for sure. Um, but what we do know <clears throat> is that your mental health, your psychological well-being, do have profound impacts on your physical health. We've seen this across the board with cardiac health, um, with so many dimensions of health, and I have no reason to believe that it would be any different uh, at the end of life. So as we think uh, about how to build, rebuild, I should say, uh, after this pandemic, as we think about what we need to do to ensure that we are never again in a situation where our health is so adversely affected, and where the elderly are so isolated, we have to think about how to build bridges between people, whether that's through technology or through other means, but ways through which they can maintain a connection to the outside world. If we had, for example, prioritized nursing homes early in the process and sought to protect them vigorously uh, with a combination of testing, of you know, having adequate protective equipment, uh, of restricting visitors so that we could reduce risk, but not necessarily entirely. Um, we may have been in a circumstance where we could have, um, I think, avoided some of the isolation uh, that we saw uh, result in the end. And my worry is that we may be headed toward a, another uh, uh, a surge, and not just in COVID-19, but in the resulting uh, loneliness that so many seniors are experiencing and the resulting outbreaks in nursing homes. 
So I do think the more we look at it, the more we recognize that um, social connection is a powerful determinant of health. And as we think about how to build a public health response, as we think about how to build a stronger medical system, we've got to think about ways and strategies for strengthening human connection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Murthy. We have one last question from Akanksha Srivastava. If you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, Dr. Murthy. Hi, Dr. Murthy. Thank you so much for your time and your advice. Um, I wanted to comment sort of, we talked about the, the sphere of medical training, and I do want to say that, so I'm a second year medical student, and I think that educators are definitely taking initiative on the topic of loneliness and medical student well-being. Um, I also just wanted to ask on your thought, uh, your thoughts on like the topic of loneliness in a world where social media is so prevalent and uh, where we seem to be so well connected every day. Yeah, well, it's uh, a really great, great question, Akanksha. I think, um, I, first of all, I just want to say I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of what medical schools are doing these days in terms of the greater awareness around well-being and the importance of well-being among students. Um, what I think is very important as, as medical schools and other educational institutions think about how to, um, how to really build a foundation for students from the youngest of ages, is I think to recognize that that is partly about what the institution does and the environment it creates for its students, but it's also about what the students do for each other, right? And it's the community that you build, it's the way in which you serve each other that can often be the most powerful powerful driver uh, of well-being. Uh, I think as we, as, we think about, um, as we think about that last piece of, of how to approach this you know, issue of loneliness, how to address it more broadly uh, in, in the community, I, I think it's just important for us to, to remember that um, you know, loneliness, again, as I said in the beginning, is very common, right? So the challenge is that because of the shame that's associated with it, and because of the fact that loneliness looks like many different things, that can look like anger, it can look like depression, it can look like anxiety, you can walk around thinking that you're the only one who's feeling lonely, right? And social media, to your point, exacerbates that because people aren't posting their lonely moments on Instagram and Facebook, right? They're posting their highlights and they're often very curated. And as one of my friends told me, the experience of being on social media is the experience of comparing your average days to other people's best days. Right? And that's why people often come up feeling short. And so I think as we consider how to build a more connected life, it's really important to do exactly what you said, which is to think carefully about how we use social media. There are ways we can use social media to enhance our connection with another, one another. So for example, if I happen to be traveling to a new city and I post uh, that I'm going to be coming uh, to New York City, is anybody free for lunch or dinner? And we actually meet up. Uh, that's a great way of using social media to strengthen connection. If I can find small communities on social media where I can share authentically and honestly uh, about what I'm going through and, and support other people uh, as they share about their experiences, that can be very powerful as well. The challenge with social media, though, comes when we do one of three things. It's when we let that culture of hyper-comparison uh, really drive us, right? Uh, which is just almost... It's largely both a, a function of the quality of experience we have, but also the quantity of time we spend on social media. The other challenge is when we spend so much time on social media that it crowds out our one-on-one -on -one interactions or small group interactions via phone or video conference or in person. And that crowding out can end up substituting low, lower quality interactions for what used to be higher quality interactions. And the final part is when we allow social media to creep in to our day-to-day -day interactions with other people. So when I'm talking to a good friend on the phone or having dinner with my family, if I allow uh, my phone to creep into my hands and I'm just quickly checking Instagram or trying to post something real quickly, or if I'm having an, an amazing experience or a vacation, but I'm spending half of it instead of talking to the people I'm with, trying to document it uh, for my followers, uh, those are ways in which social media can dilute the quality of our interaction with other people. So I think the key is to have boundaries around social media, to not allow it into certain sacred spaces where we have conversation. It's to limit how much time we spend in, in totality on it. And it's to try to focus the ways in which we use social media, uh, to try to 
limited to circumstances and settings where we can actually share authentically, when we can uh, be honest about what we're going through, and when we can express and share our support for others in ways that feel true uh, and satisfying to us. And I'll just turn it over to our founder of Indiaspora, Amar Rangaswamy. Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, Vivek and uh, Sejal, this has been one of the most fascinating in diaspora meetings we've had in a few months. I think great thoughtful questions uh, by Sejal and uh, Vivek, very, very profound answers by you. And one thing uh, I will take away is your, how to redefine success. And I think too, much, too many of us get caught in fame, popularity, and other measures. And I think it's uh, something you've given me thought personally to redefine my own success criteria to be based on the relationships that I would like to have and nurture and leave with. So th thank you so much for that personal advice to me as well. I know there's been a lot of chat here, uh, many different questions we couldn't get to. I apologize for that. We need another hour or two. But a couple of things. Uh, we did uh, publish in the chat a way to get the book less expensively. Uh, and it looks like a lot of people have taken advantage of it. But if you haven't, please do so. It's available for a couple more days. Someone has already bought the Audible version. They didn't want to wait for the hardcover. I think they've already gotten the book in the Audible format. So it's available uh, many different ways for you to, to read. Uh, and once again, uh, Sejal and Vivek, really, really want to thank you on behalf of Indiaspora and our membership. Uh, this is probably something, you know, there's a recording available. We'll publish on our YouTube channel as well. So really, hopefully many more people will come and listen and, and take advantage of and take the advice that you have so thoughtfully given us. So once again, thank you so much and uh, good night.